So you're ready to be taught on this wonderful, wonderful lessons that we've been hearing about the Holy Spirit and the gifts, the gifts. Remember what the first one loves? Love. I mean, you know what the title of today's message is? No, well, it's love. I mean, it's all based on that, but it's in your bulletin. And it's about you. you you've got to believe. You believe and watch him work in you. Brother Larry, come on up, Praise brother. Amen. Glory to God. Here he comes Hallelujah. in living color. So he was able to keep his coat on. Hallelujah. Okay. Precious Lord, Master, friend, I talk to you today because your people needs to hear your voice. Lord, we thank you that you've given us knowledge to know that there's some things that's hindering your voice, and so Lord, we thank you you're going to help me to get that hindrance out of their way. In Jesus' name. And so I say peace in Jesus' name. Open in Jesus' name. Receive in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Some people want to know why we spend so much time on the, teaching on the gifts. Well, I really share it with a lot of other words from God, but <clears throat> because what I realize is that the gifts come by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Gifts needs to be taught over and over until you can finally say, I got it. I got it. I can. No, I will operate in the gifts. Amen. He's ready for you to operate all the time, any time. But we have to ready ourselves to be able to receive what he has for us. You know, that repetition is important. If it wasn't, Jesus wouldn't have taught that way. When he taught out of Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, the language says that he taught them over and over and over. It wasn't a one-time message. It was over I can just hear Peter, yeah, yeah, Peter saying, yeah, I got it. I know, I know, I know, I know. But he didn't have it at all. So Jesus kept preaching it over and over. I remember there was a, I think I've told you the story, but there was a, a man in Canada that him and his family would show up, and I started teaching about tithing. And I taught a little bit about tithing every service. And he always, every service, was just as faithful to write me a letter and tell me that I was wrong. But what did I do? I kept teaching it over and over. Guess what he ended up being? One of my pastors. <laughs> I put him in a church way on up north. And uh, guess what he's teaching? Tithing. You see, if I'm teaching on the gifts, what are you going to be teaching? Did you see that? Mm -hmm. So he taught it over. I can just about hear old Peter's, Jesus talking to Peter and said, Now, Peter, did you get it? Andrew, how about you, Matthew? What do you think I said? Over and over. When you start seeing the life of the Holy Spirit living in and through you, then you can say, I got it. I got it. Glory to God. Well, let's, let's just back up just a little bit into last week's message where we taught 
on how the scripture breaks down the gifts and not how man breaks them down. Man breaks them down to three, three, and three, and there's nothing wrong with that fleshly definition. But the scripture brings it down to two, five, and two. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge is the first two. And then eteros, another gift of a different kind. Then we have the next five. And another gift of a different kind. Then we have the next two, tongues interpretation. We know word of wisdom, word of knowledge go together. We know tongues interpretation go together. And we know we see an intermingling of those five all the time. It's just something that happens. Well, we got down on the gifts to uh, discerning of spirits. And probably one of the most misunderstood, and I've heard definitions of everything you can imagine, and every doorknob has got a demon in it. I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, they just go on and on. They have no idea what that's really talking about. To discern something is something that you not only know, but you see. I can see it. I just don't, you know, a lot of people has, I just operated out of discerning experience. What you operated out of was probably suspicion. Maybe an if. God's not expecting them. His gifts is never a maybe an if. It's absolute. I've got it. I've got it now. I can see. I can hear. It's going to be a manifestation of seeing and hearing. And, and the five senses. In other words, a gift is designed to come out of the spiritual realm and come into the natural realm where the physical senses can see it and feel it and touch it. For instance, let me give you an example. And I probably have. I, I've got so many of the Lord's. You know, I, I just lived a blessed life uh, of walking and operating in his gifts and workings and miracles so frequent that I, I don't even recall them all. It's been so many. But Sue, we lived in Rogers, Arkansas at the time, and she, uh, everything was okay. We'd gone through some hard time. We'd come right out of it, and we was living okay. We just, we were just living in Rogers, Arkansas, and I had a, a business selling. Uh, selling and, and, and uh, working on all the cash registers for Walmart. And I had my office right in there with, right there just close to where Sam's is at, and it was just okay. Every snow push, I had, I was ahead always by two weeks, and so I had, anytime I wanted to, I could sit down and listen to somebody preaching, or I could start studying something. I had all the time, I, I had, we had it made. And so there was no reason for anything to be, be a, to, to bother. But we went to bed one evening, and I passed out, went to sleep. And next thing I heard was Sue crying. And she was just crying and crying, and it just got loud. I turned over and I said, what's the matter? She says, I'm afraid. I said, what are you afraid of? I said, I'm right here. What are you afraid of? I hope she wasn't going to say you. <laughs> but she says, I'm afraid of dying and death. And so I turned back over, closed my eyes, and, and uh, the Lord began to tell me something. Turn over and look at the foot of the bed. And when I did, I seen the demon at the foot of the bed. I seen it with my eyes. It was there, just as it was spiritualized, but I seen it plain and clear. I can describe it to you. It had the huge, had the body of a man and the head of a goat. Ugly thing. And uh, it was down there at the foot of the bed, and just as soon as I seen it, I knew what to do about it. So I just cast it out in the name of Jesus, and it's just like that thing, whew, gone. I don't know what went through a door or through the ceiling or where it went, but it's gone, just like that. And so all of a sudden, a peace began to settle over her. And I, I told her, I said, 
you'll never have it again. And she never did. She's never been afraid of death. She's been right at death's door so many times, but never again. You see, when you're able to discern something, you can do something about it. Whether that's by hearing, because you have spirits you're going to be listening to or seeing, whether it's positive or negative, whether it's good or whether it's evil. It's just that simple. God gives you that ability so you'll know what to do about it. And that was just it. She's never had a problem since. And so we just turned over and went back to sleep. It was over with. And no matter when those things come up, it's just like all of a sudden, there it is. It was upon me. I knew it. I, I, I was able to see it I, I, just as well as I'm looking at you. So later on, I got to talking to the Lord about that. And I said, Lord, I've always under the understanding that every time you've seen a demon, there was some little small thing. He said, but you don't realize, he said, the spirit of death is one of the most powerful of all the demons. And almost all the other uh, things or demons comes out from this demon and draws its power from death. And almost everything in life is related to, to death in itself. Of fears are, and uh, and so he said that's that's why, and so we need to be able to understand and take authority over death. Death can't stand in your presence or my presence when we're in the spirit. In the spirit, you know. I remember another time is on the positive note. One morning, it was, I was still in Rogers, Arkansas, and it was just flood. It was gushing down on us. It, the rain was just pouring and pouring. Well, I needed to get down to Walmart uh, headquarters there, and, and uh, so I went out to start the car. It wouldn't start. And it's raining and just pouring rain. It, I tried and tried and tried. It wouldn't start. And I had an old uh, 1970 Buick Electra 225, big old dog. And uh, I opened the hood up. And I got an amazing thing when I opened it up. There's an engine. Now what? I had no concept what to look for. I don't even know why I opened up the hood. At least I'm honest about it. I had no, I, I, had, I didn't know what to do. And so I stood there just kind of gazing at the things and waiting for something to happen, for you to tell me something. And all of a sudden, I realized in our neighborhood, you, it, back in that time, you don't have no Mark IVs, Lincoln Continental Mark IVs. You didn't have them back there, baby blue come driving up, they're not in our neighborhood, I'll guarantee you, stopped right in front of our house, got out, and he says, Reverend. That caught me right off because how'd he know that? There was nothing to indicate it. He called me Reverend. And he says, if you go get that distributor cap and replace it, it'll work. And so then, okay, so we went in the house. And then he says, can I take your kids to school? And I said, yeah, sure. And there he go, driving off. You know, some people don't really will not ever really understand it. They got to be so, 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 so to make it an angel. But you, you can't, you can't, judge. it's by, I knew what that, creature was. It was inhuman. It looked it, real thin, a small guy. But he wasn't, it wasn't big or anything like that. He just, there was. It was there for what I could see. An angel in the word, if you will. And I said, Sue, do you realize we just told a stranger to take our kids and drive off? Well, he delivered them to school. I walked down, get the part, 
a distributor cab for it. I very carefully put it on, and it started instantly. Angel unawares is also discerning of spirits. That brings it over to, there's so many angels that's around us all the time, but we can maybe sometimes sense something's there. Or sometimes we may have no concept at all, but they're still around us doing their job. And, and the key is, is once we begin to step over into things, God can, God can do so many things for you. And he's, willing, he's got all these angels here to be able to bring services unto us, to bless us, to help us, to protect us. Well, I did what the angel said. He gave me instruction. The angel did what I couldn't do, and diagnose it. And I did what I could do, and I put it on. And it worked. There's a lot of times that God really desires to do something, and all of a sudden something will come to you, and now that could be dismissive. You've got to be careful about that. You know, as, as well, when we was up in Canada, um, we was having a, a really good, just like, it was a really good worship service today. And we was having, it was just good. And, it, and then all of a sudden, uh, everybody in the congregation are looking around. Who's doing that singing? All around us, all of us. It was a big number. A good number of people was out that day. And all of them began to hear that. And the, and the, the band, which was really good, they stopped. The guy leading the music, he stopped. Then the Spirit of the Lord, as I was hearing, he told me, he says, lead them into singing in the heavenly language. And so, as you know, I'm not exactly the, the singer by choice that you want to hear. But anyhow, that was a fantastic time. I began to lead the congregation and the angels into singing and everybody heard it. It wasn't just a flaky preacher. Everybody heard the angels singing. What is that? That's a discerning of spirits. I knew what it was. He told me what to do about it. And it was a wonderful service. Amen. God's wanting you to do some wonderful services right here. We just have to get ready for it. But then there was another uh, another word in the Greek language that was eteros, another gift of a different kind, so we set into the last two. And that is tongues and interpretation. Now, you can, you can give a tongue and you're talking to God. Okay? You're just talking to him. You're not talking to me. You're not talking to anybody else. You're talking to him when you're speaking in a tongue. Why? Because none of us understand it. Well, what happens then? Then, a voice of God then comes to you or to another to give the interpretation. You was dealing with something in the spirit to God, and God then was dealing out of the spirit into the natural to you, and you just gave the interpretation. I remember, Pastor, when we was over on the, the theater, you know, quite a few years ago now, and uh, we, uh, it was just a good service that morning, very peaceful. And all of a sudden, there, the Lord directed me into, to give a tongue, and I did. Then he directed me to give, he told me the interpretation to it, and I began to give the interpretation. Then there was a lady there that came forward later and said that she, she spoke in Spanish. She said, when I, my tongue was real Spanish and very good. Then she said, the interpretation of what I said was exactly what was said in Spanish. God will just do, wants to do so many things in so many different ways. Don't limit what God wants to do. Amen. Just let him, let God be God. And you may have some questions on 
people sometimes, but main thing is just go to God, period, and let the, let the results be a matter of him and his word and not on people. Can save you a lot of heartache. Remember when there was a woman in town that she, uh, uh, it, was, it was not good, it was not right, but it, was, it drawed a huge, huge crowd because she'd have gold everywhere. Well, some of that gold was taken and analyzed. It was plastic flakes. You think God, if he's going to do something like that, is going to throw plastic at you? And see, here's the thing. All the gifts are for a purpose, Amen. for a reason. And if, if those purposes or reasons aren't met, it's not of God. And so I notice nobody's getting healed. No one, not one's getting saved. What's the purpose? Just to show some gold flakes? Why? Because right after they take the offering up. You see, what we have to realize is if a gift operates, it's for, it's for a person to be able to come to the Lord or to be able to change their life back around toward the Lord. Gifts are for a purpose. It's not just to be shown and seen. You know, a lot of years ago, Buddy Harrison, he used to come up to our church in Canada quite a bit, and, and uh, I used to love the way that him and Pat Harrison could flow together in the gifts. In fact, as has been said, it's the, one of the most best flowing in the gifts that, that anybody had ever seen. Where Pat was Kenneth Hagin's daughter, and, and he and Buddy himself was really a man of the Spirit. And uh, when he, he began to uh, stand back there, and Pat, she came forth and she started giving a tongue. And she was doing all these things. She was walking up and downstairs and upstairs. But all that time, Buddy was sitting there with his, with his eyes closed going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And she just continued on. She did all these things up and down, hands raised, you know, bowing or whatever. Then when Buddy got up, everything she did he did, and gave the interpretation to it. You see, and when he, but when he came on up to Canada, he gave a tongue. Then he told me, you interpret it. And so I got up, and I got it. The Lord gave me the interpretation. I delivered the interpretation, and and. That's how it can work, too. Yeah. Or I could give the tongue, and the Lord could just as easily give me the interpretation of that tongue. Can you see how that, see how that works? It just flows together. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and verse number 13. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 13. I think I'll get it here in a minute. There, here we go. Therefore, as a result of everything that we've learned, let him. Let him. Let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. So what I said was just balanced out with Scripture, wasn't it? God's not going to ask you to pray for something you can't have. Amen. So if I pray for the interpretation, a tongue's been given, I can give it. Now there is times I will sit back, I'm waiting for someone else to be able to go ahead and flow in it so they can learn how to be able to flow in the things of the Spirit. So let him pray that he may interpret. But notice this, for if I pray 
in a tongue. What am I doing? I'm talking to God. My spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. And when I'm saying those words, I don't know what those words are saying. What's the conclusion then? I will. I will. Amen. I will. When Buddy used to have me training the pastors and getting people filled with the Spirit, we had a very, very large church up there, and, and uh, I had about 25, 30, pa uh, 30 ministers then that was working with me uh, in the counseling to be able to counsel people that came down to be filled with the Spirit. And the same thing, I did the same thing with Kenneth Hagin's camp meeting. We had a fair large number of people. We, we would, I mean, man, we may get 1,500 a night filled with the Spirit. Mm. But you know, one of the first things I've learned to say, and I taught this pastor is, I will. I will. And then I turned around to them and I say, will you? Will you? If you're not going to obey God, it's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. I will. I will pray with the Spirit. So that's a choice, isn't it? That's a matter of faith then, isn't it? This is scriptures for faith. So these two uh, uh, gifts operate by faith because he gives us the direction for it in the Word of God. I will pray with the Spirit, but notice this. I will also pray with my understanding. So I will. I will then give the interpretation. That's my faith. Now what happens here, sometimes you may hear a word from the Lord. Sometimes it may be a, a sentence or a phrase even. And you heard that, but that's all you got. Just give it and just keep going. And when the God's finished, stop. Just like that. Don't go on off over into the flesh and keep it trying to push it. Just stop when it's done. Amen. And what you'll find is some, you'll get better at it in time. Just like we've learned the things of faith for healing. We get understanding it better. As time goes, we gain more faith to be able to see things happen. So it's the same thing here. When I'm speaking in tongues and I give the interpretation, then I get better. Well, how am I going to do this to, to get better? Well, Buddy Harrison said one time, he told the congregation, he said, I'll tell you what you do. Go home, get off by yourself, pray in the Spirit, then pray for the interpretation. Now, let me tell you what oftentimes happens when you're doing it that way. You're going to be praising God. That's what, you're, that's what it's going to be. You're just going to be praising him. But then you may find there comes a time that he gives you some direction. Or you're with someone, and he'll give them some direction. It's very simple, but we try to make everything so complex, so difficult. It's not. It's not that difficult. It's just obeying. Be ready. Obeying. Get in there and get... You see, what happened is... While you're back there in the, in the closet, if you are, in your bedroom or wherever, and you're doing what I'm saying, you're going to be able to get where you're flowing, and you're going to get where you're sensitive, and you're going to get where your spiritual ears are, are working better, and you can hear more clear. So in the beginning, sometimes it's, what did you say? And I've had them tell me again and again. And you'll get direction and the next thing you know, you're, you're really beginning to hear the voice of the Spirit much more readily. And in time, you're going to be able to see some action really begin to take place when you do so. So pray that I may, that my, uh, so if I pray in a tongue, my, uh, uh, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What's the conclusion? I will. Pray with the Spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. Hallelujah. See, that's what the Lord told me to do when he, we was directing the choir. 
to see in the Spirit. And all joined in. So then I will pray with the understanding. I'm going to pray the interpretation to it. So I'll sing with the Spirit, I'll sing with the understanding. Can you begin to see how it's not that difficult? In the book of Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 12, it says, I tell you the truth. Anyone, anyone, say anyone. anyone. Me, I'm an anyone. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. Well, that'd be amazing enough if Jesus had stopped just right there. But he adds an amendment to that statement. He says, he will do even greater things than these. How many know that we need the Holy Spirit? Not maybe, not if. I can't do without him. I'm, I'm absolutely walking blind in this world. Down Interstate 44 at, at time to go to work. I'm walking right down the middle of it without the Holy Spirit. But I'm with the Holy Spirit. It's, I can just walk right on through. Now, I'm not telling you to go on, get on 44 and do, get some dumb. But the key is, is this. We need the Holy Spirit. There's much like an example like this. There were some surveyors. And they went to a remote mountain. And it, the idea was in this mountain, small mountain range here, and it had a lot of terrain, and they needed to be able to draw a map, design a map of that terrain. So every day they'd go up this rugged old hills, and every night they'd return back to camp. And usually every night they were joined by an old shepherd who enjoyed the companionship of them around the fire. And that reminds me of of Brother Dennis around the fire where he's had some really good times. And this this old shepherd and the surveyors, they would uh, tell their stories and adventures that had happened and some of them up on the mountain. One evening, the old shepherd insisted that he's going to accompany these surveyors the next day so they would not become lost. Now, you just got into their pride. I'm a surveyor, and I got a map, and you're going to see that I don't get lost. I don't care how good you think you are. There's not very many hunters that's been out there in the field that hadn't got lost. I have. I know I've heard Dennis tell about it. You get out there and you get lost because it might be getting dark or not even daylight yet, and you're out here roaming around in some places you're not used to, and it don't look the same anymore. So feeling very sure of themselves after so many successful trips. They asked why he felt he needed to go alone. Well, the shepherd quietly replied, I must go with you. Still puzzled, the surveyors again began to describe the the many hikes up these mountains and the familiarity with, uh, with with the area. Yet again, the shepherd insisted, I must go with you, for I know the mountains like the back of my hand. And if I don't go with you, you're going to become lost. But whatever aggravated them in the past of what he said, now he got them. So the surveyors replied, we now have a map made of the area. And the shepherd quickly responded, but there is no fog on your map. So despite the shepherds claim that two experts said they headed out real early to get ahead of the, uh, of the old uh, shepherd. So they went up the mountain, and they soon found themselves in a real thick fog. 
I've been there. I've seen that. Boy, that fog is so thick, I can't find one tree. Uh, or not, I don't know which way I'm going. I don't know of no direction. I don't have no company. I don't, have, I don't know which way I'm going. It's so thick. So they headed up early the next morning. And that fog set in. They were lost. And they wandered literally all over the mountain. And they began to get tired. And suddenly out of the fog, here comes the old shepherd. And he got beside them and he led them home through the fog. Can any of us relate to that story like I did? We feel so sure of ourselves Maybe not on the mountain, but we feel so sure of ourselves in this or that, the thing that I'm an expert in, that we actually got lost in it. Didn't know which way we're going. Didn't know what to do about this circumstance or that. And maybe you faced it a dozen times, but all of a sudden it seemed like this is something new. May not be, but the fog sets in. We have been doing just fine on our own, and we don't need any help with forging ahead and marking our own territory and making our own maps, they said. We, we chart out. We, we charted it out. We, we know where it's at. But you see, here, here's the key. There's a life pathway. But sometimes you get off that path and never realize it. And now you're out there by yourself in life situations. The good news for us today is we can be thankful for God's gentle, guiding spirit who will always come to us to direct us and deliver us to safety. I'm never without. But you see, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us all the time, we don't allow him to direct us all the time. Because sometimes in our, in our thick, foggy minds, we take control and we take that away from him. And we try to do it in the flesh. And so we get in trouble. Anybody ever been in trouble except me? Our guide and our comforter, the Holy Spirit dwells in our presence. It is upon us right now. Well, the question then comes, how... Do we live in the Spirit? How are we conscious of that? Let me give you another story. They said we, we took our kids into the Air and Space Museum a couple weeks ago, and there was a cross, 10 foot cross section of an American Airlines Douglas DC 7. And you could board it and just walk through it, it just sliced off. Okay, a section of it. And you can begin to walk through and see it. And the dad looked over at the little child and he noticed that the three-year-old Joshua's face said, I'm not sure about that plane. And he, and he said, do you, you want to see the airplane, Joshua? And he says, it not take off? By the way, all day Joshua kept asking him, he said, if stuff was going to take off. See, it's hard to explain, he said, but my wife and I marveled at the childlike perspective. It was a 10-foot cross-section inside of a building, a museum. It didn't have an engine. There was no runway, and Joshua thought it might take off. That's the impossible, isn't it? That's the beauty of childhood. They don't know what can't happen. They don't know what can't happen. And he says, come like little children. Now you don't know what can't happen. Not a bad definition of faith. You know you have faith when you don't know what can't happen. I mean, anything I'm open can happen now. 
So when the disciples started following Jesus, in the very beginning, I don't think they had any idea what to expect. Could you imagine yourself? He just called you out of the boat and said, follow me. And you said, okay. Now what do you expect? You have no idea what to expect. But you said, there's something on the inside. And told them, go ahead. And they said, okay. At the end of three years, they saw Jesus do so many wild and so many unbelievable things, finding money in a fish. Wild. Seeing, seeing him walk on the water. Wild. Seeing leprosy healed. Seeing blind eyes open. Seeing limbs restored. At the end of three years, wonder what the thoughts were different from what it was when they started. That's the same with you and I. We may have been in this for a long time, but unless you begin to really follow him or you get to the point you say, I don't know what can't happen. That's what they was at. And because they didn't know what he couldn't do, God did some amazing things even through them later on. The key is what do you really expect God to do in and through you now, today, right where you're sitting? What do you expect? Yes, but you say, in this day and time, how do we walk in the Spirit? Well, I'm sure glad you asked. Let's find out. And I'm not going to say next week. <laughs> I discovered, upon studying the language concerning the fruit of the Spirit, that the fruit is singular, yet there's nine fruit. The fruit is singular, but there's nine fruits of the Spirit. Jesus is love. And everything good, whatever it is, comes from Jesus, who is love. So everything, all the other definitions of the, of the fruit then comes out from love. Because of love, this happened. Because of love, that happens. Everything goes back to love. We can know the essence of joy, and it comes by giving. And love gives. God so loved, he gave. The essence of peace is inner stability. No matter what the outward condition, no matter how high the waves or how hot the furnace, still peace. Without love, there is no peace. I have to know that he loves me so great that those waves can't overtake me. I have to know it. So now let's take a look at some of these manifestations of the fruit in Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22. But the Holy Spirit produces the kind of fruit in our life, love, joy, peace, patience, good, kindness, goodness, fruitfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against, against, there is no law against these things. Now, the New Testament speaks of several different kinds of fruit. We bring fruit to him when we be, bring people to him to be saved. We see that in Romans 1.13. Or for holy living in Romans 6 and 22. And gifts brought to God, like the Macedonians did, in Romans chapter 15, verse 26 or 28. And good works. You know, there's positive and negative energies of the flesh. We can do some good things out of the Spirit, and that's the only thing that pleases God. Or we can do some good things out of the flesh, and that's just on you.
Now, the fruit of the Spirit listed in this passage primarily has to do with character. It's important to be able to distinguish the gift, singular, of the Spirit, which is salvation. The gift. Without that, you have nothing else. Without that love, you have nothing else. And you see that in Acts chapter 30, uh, 2, verse 38 and 11, 17. And the gifts, plural, of the Spirit, which has to do with our character put into service. Our character put into service, 1 Corinthians 12. From the graces of the Spirit, which relate to Christian character. You may say, okay, fine, but what has fruit got to do with operating in the gifts? Are you ready? Let me tell you, everything. Without the fruit, the fruit, even the gifts comes across raw. It's unfortunate that there's an overemphasis on gifts has led some Christians to neglect the graces of the Spirit or the delivery system. The graces is the delivery system of the gifts. You know, I like to watch my roses uh, out front, and I like to watch time it comes up a little bitty tiny bud, then it begins to grow, and it begins to grow, and then it begins to spread out, and all of a sudden, the next morning you walk out, and it's full blossom. That's why your gifts are going to work, and that's how, I mean, your, 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 your graces is going to work, and all of a sudden, you've got a full bloom. That's how you're going to start working in the gifts, from a bud to a full bloom. Glory to God. We've got to decide, first of all, which comes first, the gifts or pure fruit? The characteristics that God wants in our lives are seen in the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. Did you know you're not going to get any, heaven, any rewards in heaven by operating in the gifts of the Spirit? Why? That's His. He gave the gifts. That's His gift. He did it. You just followed him. What you're going to get rewarded on is the fruit. You get rewarded on the delivery system. Like a hose, that's the delivery system. But the water has to flow through it. Can you see that? The final three qualities of the, uh, of the fruit is faith or faithfulness or dep dependability and meekness. Are you ready for the word definition of meekness? The right use of power and authority. When I'm operating in the, the, the grace of meekness, I am about to be able to give a delivery system that's under control. It's utilizing the power and utilizing the, the uh, authority in meekness or being teachable as he is teaching you to do it, not adding something to it, not one little thing. Being meek. And it's not weakness. Jesus said, I'm meek and lowly at heart. Moses was very meek, yet no one ever accused them of being weak. But at the same time, the meek Christian doesn't just throw his spiritual weight around or assert himself. Just as wisdom is a right use of knowledge, so meekness is the right use of authority and power. Excusia uh, and, and dunamis. I'm, I'm under the authority here, and I'm utilizing it according to the authority, and I allow that to go forth then, sliding out on the ramp of meekness. Glory to God. It's possible for the old nature to be able to counterfeit some of the gifts of the Spirit, but the flesh can never produce the pure fruit of the Spirit. 
One difference is this. The fruit, a spirit produces fruit, but when the flesh is at work, the person who is inwardly proud of himself, I did it. And is pleased when others, and almost demands a compliment. He expects others to be able to compliment him or her. The work of the Spirit is to make us more like Christ and his glory. Whatever I do, it's because of what I've seen the Father. He gives it all back to the Father. And we give it all back to him. And he gives it all back to the Father. The Father receives all glory according to the word of God. The cultivation of the fruits is important. Paul warns that there must be a right atmosphere before the fruit will grow. In Galatians 5, 25 and 26. Just as a fruit cannot grow, you know, just you take a you take a peach. Do you ever think about trying to grow a peach at the North Pole? or up in Antarctica somewhere. You're not going to grow it. It has to have the right kind of atmosphere. And that's where the atmosphere is the fruit for the, for the things of the Spirit to be able to grow on. Without growth of the fruit, you have nothing for the delivery of the gifts. Let me give you an example. It's like rain and sunshine. If you have rain but no sunshine, there's no growth. But if you have sunshine and no rain, all you got is a desert. Still no real growth. So we need the Word and the things of the Spirit or the fruit to be able to come together so that we can grow for the purpose of another. I'm not growing for my purpose. I, you're not growing for your purpose. You're growing for the purpose. That's what the fruit do, does. It For the purpose, I've got to get the gift to you. i got to give. i got to give. I have to give. I, I, I can't live without giving. You see what I'm saying? So to walk in the Spirit means to keep in step with the Spirit, not to run ahead, not the lag behind. This involves, as what Steve talks about, intimacy with the Lord. And you gain that intimacy through the Word, through prayer, through worship, through praise, through fellowship with the Father that leads to fellowship with the others, with the saints. Glory to God. It also means the ability to pull out weeds so that the seed of the word can take root and can bear fruit. So we've got to remember that this fruit is, is produced to be eaten, not to be shown. If you take a tomato and you set it up the windshield, uh, windowsill for just a little while, it, will, it, will be, it can be a little bit green, but then it will gradually turn orange or red. But after a while, what happens? It gets mushy if it's not used. So all the, all the, the uh, fruit it, through you is designed to be used for the benefit of someone else to have and to eat. People around us are starving for love. They're starving for joy and for peace and all the other graces of the Spirit. And then and when they find those in our lives, they know they, there's something lacking in their own life and they want to become a disciple of yours as you are a disciple of, of Jesus. As, as people were a disciple of John and as John was a disciple of Jesus. So when they try to give us the glory, what do we do? We just pass it on. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. We do not bear fruit for our own consumption, even though we will gain some of it. 
we bear fruit that others might be fed and helped and brought back into the alignment that the Lord wants of him. The flesh may manufacture some results that bring that praise that pray, and praise then goes to us. But you see, God is wanting the fruit because the praise never goes to the messenger. The praise goes to God. When they try to give us glory, we just pass it on. My, my, my. Love causes me to be patient with others. Amen. And as I am, then that, that gift can flow toward those others. But if I don't operate in love toward that person, the flesh is going to ang get, uh, get angry with that person because it didn't receive what you had to give the first time. And so you give it to them again. Like the, like the guy in Canada that wouldn't receive about tithes and offerings. Give it again. Give it again. What did I do with his letters? I don't know. I have no idea. But I gave it to him again until he got it. And that's what we do with the fruit. I got it. Now I can give it. That's the whole purpose behind that, is being able to give it. Meekness is also a teachable attitude. He learned from the Father. Temperance is self-control. Going on and on with these, I'm not going to spend much time in that. Pure love, only given, is a great miracle. A great miracle received because that may save that person from suicide. Amen. Pure love, say, stop death. Can you see that? You know, Pastor was talking about Jubilee earlier, and, and Steve did too a little bit. I thought, I think those guys are going to preach my message. In the Old Testament, the year of Jubilee, was the 50th year, right? Yep. Not with us. Jubilee is every day. I've got, I've got him blessing me every day. I mean, better than they could have been blessed with the old blessings. They got the old blessings back. We get new ones every day. Not once in 50 years. Glory to God. That's good news. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we know some of the gifts is going to be done away if we go to heaven climb. We don't need them. And when we get there, they're going to look like, that's child's play. You know, when I go to paint a picture, and I may start over, over one side or something like that, and I'm, I'm painting this tree, and I'm working it very close to getting all the little small, small details in, putting the background behind it and then adding to it, and then and adding to that, and adding to that. At the time, that looks like almost the whole picture. But there, in a little while, you'll see that's just a part of the whole picture. That's what gifts is today. It's just going to be a part of the whole picture we're going to get one day. Amen. Glory to God. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, I'll pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Glory to God. I've got inner strength. How about you? He's going to empower us with that. Then, once you're empowered, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love. And keep you, keep you strong. And verse 18, and you may have the power to understand that it's, it's great to fully understand. Then you are made complete with the fullness of life and power. I am made what? I'm made complete with the fullness of life 
and power that comes from God. Verse 20, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us. Mighty, that's an authority and power is a miracle working and, and that's all within us is being stirred up and delivered out on the fruit. Let's go on with that. Who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Verse 21, what am I going to do then? Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and forever. Hallelujah. Amen. So be it. So remember this, the gifts of the Spirit always brings glory to the Lord Amen. while helping others. You can put it like this. You cause the others to be able to shine, then the Lord gets to shine. And you've got to be the messenger delivering the gift of God. You're not special. You're, the, you're just the messenger. Don't get so caught up. You, sometimes people get so wrapped up in, the, in, in what that amounts to that they never operate in it. I'm a messenger boy. That's all I got. I got a fantastic career as a messenger boy. And so are you. So others can shine, the Lord can shine. Never take his glory. Just give it to him and then don't try to take it back. I get the joy of being able to be the watering hose, the messenger. I'm blessed. I have lived a blessed life. I may not have much in the way of the physicals in this life, but I'll tell you what I've got. i got a lot of spirituals in this life. I wouldn't trade my life for anyone. I've got the joy of the Lord on the inside of me. I get the joy of just being that watering hose, delivering the message. And as I deliver this message today, my prayer is that you shine and the Lord gets the glory. For I'm only the messenger boy that has the privilege of delivering these thoughts of the Lord to you. God bless. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And now part number five. Test. There we go. How many of you have experienced some of the gifts supernaturally in your lives? Isn't that great? Praise God. You know, I can remember uh, being so moved one time to pray. I, I had seen a man named Joe Papel, and uh, he had healings galore in his meeting. So anyway, there was a woman that had a, a shoe on her right side built up six inches four to six inches, and her hip, it was her whole life she was that way, and she was elderly, and she had a huge, you know, her hip was just, she would walk like this and throw that shoe around. And uh, Joe uh, was would sit people in chairs, and her legs would grow out right in front of you. <clears throat> and I'd never seen anything like that. And, uh, but I kept hearing all these testimonies about people having a leg grow out. Well, most people, when you go to a chiropractor, it's because you're out of joint, you know. And so, but you can have uh, one leg shorter than another. You just need an adjustment. So, but anyway, this lady, four, I'm going to say four to six inches, that thing was huge built up. So she walks up there like this. 
and I'm, it, it just had one aisle right down the center, and I'm sitting there watching this like this. I mean, I want to see this. He set her down in that chair, lifted her foot up, shoe and all, and that thing went just instantly. And when it did, I went <gasps> like that and real loud. And everybody just turned around and started laughing at me because I'd never seen a miracle. I went around telling everybody about that. The next night, the whole front row was full of Nazarenes, good, good people, but they didn't believe in the healing like that. And then they saw miracles galore. Then they came up and that... It all, all the glory goes to Jesus. Amen? It just goes to Jesus. And you are, when you're walking in agape love, you, how many of you have seen people that you just wanted to pray for? That no matter what, <clears throat> you just wanted to pray for and get them well. And there's gifts of healings. And remember this. There's no such thing as the gift of healing. If you had the gift of healing, everybody would get healed. It's gifts of healings. But wasn't this good? This is awesome. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Oh, no. I, boy, I thought of it just about a second after you did. <sighs> well, you just see... Somebody has to be in the spirit, and it's me. So I just forget because I'm so in the spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It is so good that everything that God does, I was thinking, everything that God does for us that is good is for the benefit of somebody else. Amen? If that's one thing we have learned through this, it's always for the benefit of somebody else. What a circle of love, indeed, life is all about. Hallelujah. Well, we hope that our live stream audience uh, enjoyed our message this morning. If you want to be able to go and spread the gospel, you can do it on live stream by going to subscribe and like and share. So share the message that you heard this morning. And you also can watch us on the YouTube also. It is offering time offering time and i have some scriptures for you today have you noticed the theme in this in the spirit has been about the goodness of god today well i'm going to share something with you in offering about the goodness of god i have four scriptures for you parts of scriptures that i want to read the first one is in psalms 20, uh, 34 and i'm going to start with verse that don't change this, but I want to start with verse 8. It says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no what? No want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger. But let's read this. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Will not lack any good thing. Then Psalms 84, starting with 11, says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Read this with me. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Again, no good thing. Is God good? Hallelujah. Here's these promises. My third one I want to read to you, you know, well, is uh, Psalms 23, verse, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then verse 6, I'll surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. But I love this last one I'm going to share. I, it is in Psalms 27, 13. I would have lost heart. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
and that is a now word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Have you received, given tithes and offerings? We're going to bless the Lord. We bring them. Yes, we want to pray over them. Glory to God. If you're online and you want to, uh, you're watching us on live stream, I mean, you can go online and also just go mmcokc.com and click on that red button, and you'll be able to also present your tithes and offerings to the Lord. Let's lift this up. Father, we have learned about your goodness. Hallelujah. It is indeed a circle. It is never meant to just stop at one place. It is a circle of love. You bless us that we might bless others. And there we do not ever in our lifetime go without lack because you are so incredibly, awesomely a God that gives and continues to give. And, and we are of your nature to be givers. We, we give our tithes and our offerings. We thank you. We honor you with it. We lift it up knowing that it is indeed going into the kingdom and spreading the good news of the gospel. We give you all praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let me just uh, say our, our announcements are is that we will not remember. We're not going to have our afternoon services for a while. You, can you believe that Wednesday is supposed to be 105? So all this week, the temperatures are going to be in a danger zone. Not that we are afraid of that by any means. It's just that it, uh, we need to, it's incredible overworking uh, the air conditioning system. So no afternoon services on Sunday. Amen. We will have our Wednesday night service. They will start at 6 o'clock. We're going to be continuing with corporate prayer. And we are continuing to have corporate prayer every Sunday morning starting at 9.30 to 9.45. Glory to God. Let's make our confession of faith over Messiah Ministries Church. Messiah Ministries Church, you know it well, serves who? El Shaddai, El Shaddai the God who is? More than enough. We just said it. Messiah and his church thinks in terms of God's abundance, not the world's shortages. Messiah Ministry Church enjoys the Lord's pro prosperity through both trouble and triumph, and nothing can stop his goodness in Messiah Ministries Church. Who's Messiah Ministries Church? We are. Hallelujah. Pastor. Pastor. You didn't tell me I did good. Oh, okay. I appreciate that. It's a shame that a pastor has to beg for compliments, you know. That's that. Hallelujah. We want to thank the last well, I think we're off there. Hallelujah. All right. Hold your hands out. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you for keeping me. Woo. Thank you for causing your face to shine upon me and being gracious unto me. Thank you for lifting your countenance upon me and giving me total peace. And it's all in Jesus. Amen. And by this shall all men know you're my disciples the way you love one another. God bless you, love somebody, you're dismissed. You are part of the fellowship of the unashamed. You have Holy Spirit power. You've leaped over the line of no return. You're a disciple of the one true king. You've made a decision. Don't look back, let up, or slow down. Your past is redeemed, your present makes sense, and your future is secure. You live by faith, trust his presence, and walk in patience. You labor by love and power and are lifted in prayer. Your pace is set, way is fast, and goal is heaven. Your road is narrow, way is rough, your mission is clear, and companions are few. Yet your God is reliable. You won't back down in sacrifice, hesitate from your adversaries, negotiate with your enemies, or work for popularity. 
You won't give up, won't let up, and can't shut up until you've stayed up, prayed up, and preached up the cause of Jesus Christ. You've been bought with a price, made new through the blood, and given great purpose. You are called the chosen, the few, kings and priests among men, set apart in but not of this world, a light in the darkness, a voice calling out the remnant. You are the church.